Competitors, fans, motor enthusiasts, adventurers and bush lovers gathered once again for the much-anticipated annual off-road 4x4 event, the Rhino Charge. The concept of the competition is simple. 65 team members using a four-wheel drive vehicle must visit 13 guard posts spread across the bush in the shortest, straightest line possible over 10 hours. Added to the fun, the location of the event is kept secret until days before each charge to avoid teams wrecking the area beforehand. The original ambition of the Trust was to build a fence around the Aberdare mountain range to protect one of Kenya's key mountain water towers and the unique biodiversity and forest found on its slopes. By 2009, the entire range had been protected by a 400km game-proof electric fence and attention turned to building a similar fence around Africa's second highest peak, Mount Kenya. Whilst the world's focus has recently been on the poaching crisis affecting Africa's elephant and rhino population, the destruction of natural habitat, mainly due to land usage change and an ever-increasing human population, plays a far greater threat to biodiversity and our natural heritage. As humans encroach ever deeper into these mountain forest regions, the conflict between humans and wildlife intensifies. Regular crop damage, mainly by elephants, has forced some farmers to erect crude electric fences in an attempt to protect their crops. With the result that in the past two years, eight elephants have been electrocuted or killed in one location alone, in the same period and location, eight farmers have also lost their lives. Rhino Arc, with its partners in KWS, local communities and government entities, have already completed the first 100 kilometers of the Mount Kenya fence, running from the Karinga River to the Thingithu River in Meru County. A second build team has moved ahead to the Amenti Forest section, where the conflict is at its worst, and has already completed 10.5 kilometers of this 20-kilometer section. Local communities have committed to raising 13.5 million shillings with KWS and Rhino Arc providing the balance of the funds that will be needed. These incredible projects have been possible in large part to the massive funds raised by the Rhino Charge competitors, who in 2015 alone raised over 108 million shillings, adding to over 1.1 billion shillings to date. Every year, the Rhino Charge moves to a new location so as to reduce the impact the event has on the environment and to support local communities through the landowner's access fee charged to every vehicle entering the venue. The 2016 Charge moved to the Olenganiet Conservancy in the Loiter Hills area, which is east of the world-famous Masai Mara National Reserve. The dense bush, luggers and steep ridged hills would provide a new challenge to the crews, with recent heavy rain threatening to throw a spanner into the works. 2015 had taken the crews to Kalepo and the Namanyak Conservancy on the eastern slopes of the Matthews Range in North Kenya. The Blue Range Rover of Team 48 took the overall honours after a close battle with the Bundu Fundis in Team 38. The semi-arid terrain would be in stark contrast to that awaiting the crews for 2016. Crews and their supporters arrived at the venue check-in on Saturday morning. Once again, access to the area was strictly by pre-purchase ticket holders only. The popularity of the event forcing organisers to find a balance between the number of people on the venue and its environmental impact. Wristbands differentiated between competitors, organisers and spectators. Access to the entire venue was restricted due to its level of difficulty and spectators would only be allowed to enjoy the gauntlet and Brookhouse guard post. Scrutineering took place on Sunday with crews gathering at HQ in a spirit of camaraderie and a chance to get a look at the latest modifications and new builds the teams brought to show off. For the officials, the main focus is safety and ensuring the GPS tracking systems were all working which would measure the exact distances the crews took to get around the 13 guard posts. With the serious business of raising funds out of the way, the competitive spirit of the crews kick in, with old rivals once again squaring up to prove who the real Bundu specialists are. The charge officially kicks off with a driver's briefing at 17.30 on Sunday afternoon. There are buffalo in here, okay? And they're quite old and they're quite curly. We cannot see them from the air, okay? So we're, we have 
no way of warning you where they are. All I can say is when the bush gets very, very thick and you find yourself crawling through a tunnel and it smells of buffalo, <laughs> don't go too far from the car. After a final word from Clark of the Course, David Lowe, the crews received a map and GPS coordinates, which would reveal where the 13 guard posts are situated. There is a mad dash as crews rush to get back to camp and begin plotting the shortest and most feasible routes between the guard posts. But ultimately, it comes down to each team's ability to judge the terrain and make wise decisions as to which sections can be straight-lined, how much time to allow for each sector, and where it's best to go around impossible obstacles like almost vertical hillsides. Added to the challenge, the crews are each assigned a start guard post and the luck of the draw on where you start can also play a factor on your choice of direction and route. There are also competitions within the competition, these being the two tiger lines up for grabs on two individual predefined sectors and the gauntlet, where the organisers had added a factor 10 calculation to encourage crews to attempt the straight line for the benefit of the eager spectators. Finally, after nine months of planning by the organisers who volunteer their time and many hours in workshops, the crews all lined up at sunrise on Monday morning behind their designated start post, ready to be led out and get a first glimpse of the terrain that awaited. Checking reality against the map always brings a moment of quiet reflection as crews assess and reassess their chosen routes, compass bearings are taken and the adrenaline begins to flow. It looks like a tough course, that's for sure. That is for sure. Uh, it's going to be challenging and very treacherous, yeah. but uh, we have a good car, it's a Jeep Langler, and we are very psyched to win this time. Yes. Well, the map the, uh, lies horribly, <laughs> <laughs> so we shall see. Bit of an eye opener out here. Yeah, we knew they would be unexpected. So, uh, but the bush is very thick. Yeah. I'm modified. Yes, like the crew. <laughs> At 07:30 exactly, the start was counted down across the radio, and the crew set off with just 10 hours to complete the course. Opening the route and the first team to arrive at the river crossing separating Toolcraft and Greenstead was the mighty Unimog of John Cagnali. They initially looked like they'd be bogged down in the soft sand, but the incredible low range of the Unimog meant they crawled inch by inch out and over the steep bank. Brandon Barber's Team 57 opted to open their campaign with a straighter, steep descent downhill towards Greensteads. As the gradient gradually increased, they were forced to pull out the rear winch to stabilise the car as it bucked its way over the rocky descent. After battling through the thick bush, they'd get through the first river crossing quickly and arrived at Greensteads feeling confident. They'd later attempt to go over the mountain from Vineyard to Little Red which turned into a seven-hour car-breaking adventure and the end of their charge. Taking an even straighter line was the mighty rover of the McKittrick team in car five. They bulldozed their way straight off the edge at Toolcraft, barely stopped at the river and arrived at Greenstead ready to attack the first tiger line that took them around the cliff face to Vineyard Church, setting two top four shortest sector distances. The Magnet Chargers switched from their Range Rover to a modified Jeep and were content to follow behind the Unimog on their first sector of the day. They would have to winch out of the river but were happy to start the day with a clean run. For the team starting at Greensteads, a quick look at the cliff face confirmed the Tiger Line to Vineyard was not in a straight line. Despite the incredible beauty, there was no doubt the day was going to be tough. The Danish team set off confidently from Greensteads in their unmodified land cruiser and were soon seen threading their way through the thick bush following a river gully in the opposite direction, looking for a gentler ascent to Toolcraft. 
The hog charge team started off well, reaching their first post in one hour. However, leaving Vineyard, they then spent the next five hours trying to reach Little Red before eventually abandoning the mission and heading to Satao. The rest of the day would be spent playing catch-up and amazingly they managed to reach 12 of the guard posts. Ian Duncan arrived from Vineyard, the team opening the Tiger Line to Greensteads and would set the seventh shortest distance. Their planned route meant that they would then attack the sector to Toolcraft up the hill, but despite some aggressive driving, they'd be forced to go a further 800 metres longer than sector winner Car 53. Their charge would end with a broken steering rack. The girls in Pearl set off confidently from Greensteads in their beautiful old Land Rover, but would take two and a half hours to reach Toolcraft. They too would have to play catch up. As Team 53 demonstrate as they arrive at the guard post, such is the determination of the crews to keep to the straight line, even the slightest deviation from the course is frowned upon. Satao was situated in a U-bend in the river, forcing anyone straight lining to attempt a crossing. The defending champions of Team 48 looked relaxed as they prepared for the day, however their charge would last less than 200 metres, when the rear diff let go and they were the first casualties of 2016. All of the teams starting from Satao headed out of the guard post along the road, choosing to avoid crossing the river at such an early stage of the day. Coming from Greensteads, that honour went to Team 41, Land Mawe, who were undaunted as they dropped down into the river. Their first attempt would prove unsuccessful. Despite attempting to winch, they were forced to drive down the river and find a new spot, costing them precious time. Coming from Hardy, Grey Cullen's attempt at the crossing was more successful, bounding out of the other side on the second attempt and bolstering the team's confidence. But the car would take a beating in the relentless bush, the gearbox started grumbling, the clutch gave in and they ran out of brakes. They'd only make it to eight guard posts. <laughs> Team 9 pulled out of Satao, underestimating the soft sand and nose planted the car off the bank. They were soon on their way, but it wasn't long before news came in that they'd run into a beehive in a thick bush. The swarm attacked and the crew were badly stung. The emergency helicopter was called to evacuate one crew member who thankfully made a full recovery. Unfortunately, it took until the afternoon before the car could be rescued from the angry bees and their charge was over. The Unimog was once again crawling across the river as Peter Kinua in the lighter land cruiser sped past further downstream on their approach from Vineyard. Going good, going good. For the team starting at Copycat, the view might have been spectacular from up on the hill, but the guard post was surrounded by thick bush and would be a baptism of fire for the crews starting there. Team 34 were already having carburetor problems that would plague them for the whole day. No, it always sits on the outside niche. No. John o. Baker in Team Rouge, Car 17, was competing three days before his wedding back in the UK and was hoping he and his best man would make it back in one piece. Also starting at Copycat was the experienced crew of Team 38, Bundu Fundis. Past winners and always in contention, they were immediately on course and crashing their way off the hill towards Hardy. A good decision as it turned out, Hardy was only approachable from the east or south sides. Just basically, he just needs to keep going straight down, okay? Straight down that way. Straight down this way towards me. Yo, you're going to put that through here, man. Team Crawler UK were equally confident as they too headed off in a straight line. However, mechanical woes meant they would also only make it to seven guard posts. <laughs> Team 34 managed to get the car running and started towards Brook House, but a consistent miss and lack of power meant their day would end just six posts later at Satao.
Team Scruffy Car 46 were opening the trail from Hardy to Copycat. Fighting their way through the bush, they discovered they were navigating off the wrong datum, resulting in their GPS misdirecting them by 300 metres. This ultimately cost them over a kilometre on the sector winners from Team 33. Pioneering the route from Brook House, Team 27 winched and scrabbled their way up the steep hill to Copycat as one of the early pathfinders. Their distance would only be 300 metres longer than sector winners the Bundu Fundis, who came through at the end of the day. Experiencing the charge for the first time were the crew in Team 8, confidently crashing their way around the charge, although their sense of direction was not always on point, with some considerable back and forth. A quick look at their route and it's clear they did a few extra kilometres. The Hatarius Chargers were enjoying a clean run. Showing signs of having been through some thick bush from Hardy, they set the third shortest sector time. As the ambient temperature started to rise, leaf-clogged radiators were also starting to overheat. Team 33, meanwhile, were working their way through the bush. Having started at Satao, by 10.15 they'd reached six guard posts, taking the sector win between Hardy and Copycat in the process. For the drivers, guiding the car through the dense bush could get disorientating at times, with nothing but a wall of branches and leaves, even concealing the bonnet. For the runners, go too far ahead and you lost the car. Trying to keep up once the car went past meant battling through thorn bushes or running across rivers. As the clock ticks by, the action gets more intense and the crews get braver. Over at the gauntlet, the action was intensifying as the spectators gathered to enjoy some of the team's efforts at straight lining down the rocky riverbed. Team 42, led by William Carr Hartley, have won the event on six occasions and they showed their experience as they made their way down the gauntlet from KWS. John Cagnali's attempt to cross a narrow gully ended with the rear of the Unimog beached on the rocks. Wayne Barrett's bushcats were making their way down the gauntlet in two-wheel drive after the front diff had cried enough earlier on in the day. The bush babes made light work of the gauntlet and would go on to complete 11 guard posts, finishing 20th overall and retaining the Coupe de Dame award. Team 64 delighted the crowds as they made their way smoothly over the rocks. They'd set the third shortest distance, 80 metres off the winners. The frying squad's purpose-built buggy was suffering a myriad of problems on its first outing, limping their way around seven guard posts but enjoying the challenge. The Victoria's Secret team in their elegant Range Rover drove as straight as possible and were rewarded with the fifth shortest distance. Back at Satao, the river was still providing plenty of entertainment. Team 53, who had finished fifth in 2015, coughed and spluttered their way out of the river in a haze of blue smoke. Their day would end after just four guard posts, the dense bush being too much for the little tick this year. Jonathan Soman was approaching from the gauntlet in his Range Rover. Dropping down into the river, he was forced to do some quick winch work. Behind on time. Yeah. But okay, we have the stock broken windscreen, so, but we're good, the car's running well. Don White's team in car one were back after a short charge in 2015. The car rebuilt and lessons learned, they were heading for a brilliant seventh overall, despite several attempts at the river crossing.
1842 crossed smoothly, much to the delight of the army of little vans eagerly awaiting them. As at all the guard posts, the teams were greeted with refreshments and plenty of encouragement, and a chance to catch their breath before once again setting off into the unforgiving bush. Fantastic! Wow! <laughs> he treated like kings. <laughs> the midday heat was taking its toll on tired drivers. What are you doing, man? I'm in the <laughs> I want to go for a swim. After a quick attempt at a straight line across the river, the mighty Team 58 opted to save time and find a shallower approach into the control. Team 51 got through the river cleanly, but would later rip out all of their brake lines and despite their best efforts, they'd only get to six guard posts. Team AK-44 attacked the river crossing in the opposite direction as they headed towards the steep climb up to Hardy, setting the sixth shortest sector distance in what was the more challenging direction, but they'd later roll. Team 26 made several attempts to climb out of the river, moving further downstream before eventually burying the car to the axles in the soft sand, all within sight of the guard post. Team Rhino Sirius had a good run from Hardy to Satow, successfully negotiating the river crossing and recording the third shortest sector distance, just 29 metres longer than the sector winners of Team 25. As the day moves into the early afternoon, the pace gets more frantic. Those teams who have spent too much time in one particular sector now finding themselves having to cut and run, using the roads to make up time, whilst being wary of the 40 kph speed limit. The crowds at the gauntlet were enjoying a great show, soaking up the atmosphere and shouting encouragement to the crews. Team 49 had managed their time well. The live tracking showed they were in contention for the win. Driving the straightest, they would take victory on the gauntlet. However, as we follow them through the bush from Brook House, they'd later roll in the donga. With oil still trapped in the top of the engine, they'd push on, blowing a hole in the head and catching fire. Their charge over for this year. The Bundu Fundis were another team in contention. Once again, the multiple winners choosing wisely where to attack and where to go around, although they were only ninth shortest on the gauntlet. Team 5 were clearly in their element. Determined to reclaim the overall honours, they'd been going straight all day. Fourth at gauntlet, they trailed Team 49 by just 12 metres. Good fun, we've done a couple of really good lines, but we wasted quite a lot of time on one of them. Um, oh, who knows, somewhere over that way. <laughs> Team 32 were forced to change vehicles after their purpose-built car refused to run. In just six hours, they converted an old Land Rover into a charge car. They'd suffer a myriad of issues, the most serious being stuck in two-wheel drive after the front diff self-destructed. The Dick Dicks in their Galindo wagon once again led the unmodified class. Some impressive straight lining and Bundu know-how meant they'd not only win the class but take fifth place in the overall honours, leaving a long line of purpose-built machines in their wake. Phil Tilly took second place honours in the unmodified class in their ageing Range Rover. They were 11th overall and the last team to complete the entire course, visiting all of the 13 guard posts. Back at Satao, Team Choms made it through the churned up riverbed as the crew eventually made it to 12 guard posts, finishing 16th overall. The crews got a respite at Brook House with relatively open terrain surrounding that guard post. We follow the Land Rover 101 of the Aussie Rules team as they meandered their way towards Slater and Whitaker on their way to 15th overall. Team 
Team 17 would call it a day having reached 11 guard posts and finishing in fourth overall in the unmodified class, the groom-to-be was still in one piece. Over at Slater and Whitaker, Team 21 were recovering from their earlier time loss and would successfully complete the course and take the final top 10 position. Using some skills more akin to sailing, Team 40 gingerly climbed over the rocks to the delight of the spectators. The team would win the Spirit of Charge Award for their efforts and also in memory of team member Dave Frankham, who tragically passed away just weeks before the event. The team would end the day in ninth overall. Tackling this year's charge with a new team leader, the Charging Hippos made it to all 13 guard posts, finishing in eighth overall. <laughs> we did get around all the checkpoints, yeah. Um, yeah, the bush was pretty thick. It was pretty hectic, but it was good. I enjoyed it. Don White's team in car one recorded their best result ever, finishing in seventh overall, only their second finish of 11 starts. The Hitarius Chargers got their monster machine around all 13 guard posts, despite getting bogged down in a river. They finished in six overall, 11 kilometers behind the winners, but were creeping up the rankings, a team to watch for the future. Team Scruffy, with first-time driver Ibrahim Namoya at the wheel, were one of only 11 teams to complete the course, finishing a brilliant and impressive fourth overall. Once again, experience and unique bush skills were in evidence, with the top three teams having won ten charges between them. It's that, that longer, we'll have to then cross that one. Oh, yeah, hang on. So, yeah, hang on a second. So it might even make more sense to stay here. Guys, it may actually be better to stay on this side, because this isn't the right longer we were thinking about. Taking the final podium honours were the Bundu Fundis in overall third, once again missing out on the top honours but with an impressive top three finish again. With six wins under their belt, Team 42 would have to settle for second, quashing the disappointment of retiring in 2015 and very happy to be back on the podium after quite a number of years off it. But it was Alan McKittrick's Team 5 that took an emphatic victory, winning by a margin of 2.1 kilometres. They reclaimed the title they last won in 2014 and brought their victory tally to four. They also won the Victor Lodora, which is calculated by taking two centimetres off their final distance for every one shilling raised. This year they raised just over 10.3 million shillings, giving them a distance of minus 160 kilometres. A quick analysis of the map shows the different and slightly diverse routes the top three cars took. At 17.30, the 2016 Rhino Charge officially ended. Most crews relieved just to have got through the day. Of the 63 starters, only 11 made it to 13 guard posts, leaving no doubt in anyone's mind that once again this was an epic challenge between man, his machine and the unforgiving African bush. We rolled. Badly. Our vineyard. Yeah, quite badly. It took us about two hours to get back on track. But uh, we've done 12, so it's not bad. In the circumstances. Back at HQ, the stories began to flow as crews celebrated. We tried our first Tiger Line. And uh, apparently, if you go the opposite direction that we went, it's doable. But if you go the direction that we went, it's not doable. So uh, we left uh, the previous checkpoint at 10 a.m. and uh, we finally uh, drug ourselves out of that mess uh, at 3.30. Uh, a very tough one this year as compared to last year. Very a lot of thicket, uh, a lot of damage to the vehicles, drive train, everything. So it will take us another year to fix it. Uh, but yes, all in all, enjoyed an amazing, amazing for a job, good man. cause. And uh, yeah, we absolutely enjoyed ourselves. The following morning, somewhat bleary eyed, they gathered for the official prize giving. The top three teams were on hand to accept their winners' trophies. Third overall, Team 38, Bundu Fundis, led by Sean Avery. 
Second overall, Team 42, led by William Carhartley. Taking the overall honours and taking back the title they last held in 2014 with a well-deserved victory, Team 5, led by Alan McKittrick. It's been great to come back to the Mara. Cooler weather, the prospect of rain, Thank you very much to the local community for having us here. We've all enjoyed it. Keep it going, please. The most important item on the agenda was the award for the highest fundraiser. This is, after all, what gathers these motor enthusiasts together in the first place. Taking third overall and finally knocked off the top spot after 14 consecutive years was the McKittrick team. They'd raised 10,315,243 shillings. Peter Kinyua and his team in car 23 took second spot, raising 11,215,000 shillings. However, taking the highest sponsorship honours with an incredible effort that saw the team raise a record-breaking 14.5 million shillings were the magnet chargers led by Stanley Kinyan Dewey. Rhino charge is about harmony for wild drive, human beings and the habitat. We are proud to have played a role in achieving the harmony. And thank you, thank you, thank you, Asante. In 2016, Rhino Chargers, with support from sponsors, families and friends, raised 139,402,565 shillings for the Rhino Ark Charitable Trust. A new record and reiterating once again the commitment of so many to saving Kenya's environment and wildlife heritage. As the dust settles and the crews return to the workshops to repair and modify their able mounts, the organisers are already on the trail in search of a new spectacular secret location in one of Kenya's remote corners for the 2017 event. Kept tightly under wraps and known only to a hallowed few. We'll see you there.